Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Episode. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to talk to you about the latest episode of Star Trek Strange New World Season 2. It was called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which is actually part of a line from a soliloquy in Macbeth, which is about the futility of life, which oddly doesn't really have anything to do with where this episode goes. But anyway, there you go. As the episode starts, we see La'an dealing with various situations on the Enterprise in her capacity as security chief, among which were delivering a noise complaint to Spock, who apparently was playing his liar a little too vigorously, and going through a bunch of artifacts that the annoying engineer lady, Pelia, has apparently acquired over a very long lifetime, and not necessarily all in ways that were above board. <laughs> and during that particular moment, Pelia refers to the Federation as a socialist utopia, which I thought was interesting. Laon then engages in a sparring match with the doctor, fitness training or whatever, who mentions that she didn't show up for the party for Una in the captain's quarters. Following that, she has a freaky encounter with an unknown individual in one of the ship's hallways, who got there by some means unknown to her or us, who has been shot with a bullet, and who tells her to take a device to the bridge, after which he disappears as a weird wave passes through the hallway and the red alert sounds. Lon then finds herself on the bridge looking for Captain Pike only to find James T. Kirk in his chair. Uhura is there in a usual place, as is Ortegas, but yeah, no Captain Pike. The ship gets a call from Spock, who is the captain of a Vulcan fleet ship, asking for help from the Enterprise in their war against the Romulans. But his request is denied, despite the fact that he says that his fleet will be destroyed and Vulcan will be defenseless. We learn that Starfleet doesn't exist and that the Enterprise belongs to something called the United Earth Fleet. Of course, Kirk doesn't recognize Laan, and they end up having a conversation about what happened to her, which he's dubious about, until he tries to take the device from her and accidentally activates it, sending them both to 21st century Toronto. Thinking they're in New York City instead, upon being corrected, Kirk says, well, he's never been to Earth, that he was born on the USS Iowa in space. And at this point, I'm really hoping they're not retconning Kirk here because that would suck a whole lot. I hope they're just saying that in this particular instance because it's an alternate version of him, but I, I, was, I was alarmed at this particular moment. Anyway, he also says that Earth is in pretty rough shape even in the 23rd century. Realizing that they need a wardrobe change, they then try on some clothes in a nearby store and create a distraction that allows them to get out of the store without paying. Whereupon, they dump their Starfleet clothes in a trash bin, which I really hope they wouldn't actually have been dumb enough to do, unless at this point they just don't care because it's an incorrect timeline that they're trying to fix anyway. But yeah, I don't know, it seemed a little reckless to me anyway. Realizing that they need money, Kirk then wins a bunch of money playing chess against some folks in the park. After getting a room and getting some sleep, they discuss La'an's plans to fix the timeline, but Kirk realizes that if that happens, his timeline gets erased. So she urges him to understand that in her timeline, Earth isn't at war, and it isn't a ruin, and humanity hasn't had to abandon it, as well as that the Federation exists and is a force for good in the galaxy as well as that rather than having to fight a war, he could just be an explorer. At which point he says that for all she knows, he doesn't even exist in her timeline, at which point she explains that he does, which she knows because of stories that Sam Kirk has told her, causing him to marvel at the fact that Sam is alive because apparently he's already died in this timeline, even earlier than he does in the correct timeline. At that point, an explosion goes off on a nearby bridge, and La'an realizes that when the man told her to get to the bridge, he meant the bridge in Toronto, not the bridge of the ship. Apparently, this bridge also gets exploded in the original timeline, so that's not what changes. The change is something else. La'an notices that the device used to blow up the bridge was a photonic bomb, a type of technology that shouldn't exist yet. And after they decide that they have to follow the government van that's taking away the bridge pieces, Kirk borrows a guy's Dodge Charger, after using the Vulcan nerve pinch on him, which apparently he learned when he spent six months in a Denoblian prison with a Vulcan cellmate, where he also learned to make plumeek soup in a toilet. Of course, when I say borrow a car, it did, of course, 
take him a few tries to figure out how to drive it. But once he does, he seems to take to it quite well because there's a crazy car chase that ensues. When he gets pulled over by the police and almost arrested, a quirky reporter makes up some bullshit and gets the cops to beg off. <laughs> Turns out that the reporter is an alien conspiracy believer, so Kirk tells her that Laan is an abductee, after which they start working together, and the woman tells Laan that she thinks aliens are trying to slow humanity down, and that's why all these things are happening, including various historical events, including the killing of JFK. She also has footage of someone who seems to have been present at the bridge waiting for it to happen, as well as a picture of a Romulan warbird, which jogs Kirk's memory. And he remembers that in a few days' time, an attack is going to destroy a cold fusion plant in Toronto, which didn't happen in the original timeline. Realizing that they could really use a tricorder, Laon suddenly remembers something that Pelly has said to her earlier, which is that she was living in Vermont in the 21st century. Apparently, though, Pelly doesn't have an engineering background at this point in time, but she still is able to help them by giving them a diver's watch that has a certain element in it that would glow in the presence of what they're looking for to find where this next event is going to occur. While they're searching, they have a conversation in which Laon discusses that she's enjoying Kirk's company because most people prejudge her based on the scarlet letter that she's been forced to wear her whole life, her name. And after Kirk pretends not to know what the scarlet letter references, they have a little smooch. It turns out that the cold fusion reactor is inside a place called the Noonien Singh Institute, and that Laon's handprint opens a security door. It further turns out that the goofy reporter is actually a Romulan from the future in disguise, and the person behind all the trouble. When she tries to get Kirk and Laon to go with her into the reactor, and they refuse, she shoots and kills Kirk, who tells Laon to say hello to Sam for him before he dies. The Romulan then takes Laon to a genetics lab because while blowing up the fusion reactor was plan A, she's decided to go with plan B, which is forcing Laon to let her into a living quarters at the lab, which is occupied by none other than Khan Noonien Singh. <laughs> so that she can kill him. Because a computer simulation in the future told her that doing so somehow results in the Federation never forming, and the Romulans never having to deal with their greatest adversary. She tells Laon that if she does this, the device in her pocket will still protect her from changes to the timeline, and she can live whatever kind of life she wants, free of the legacy of <laughs> But after pretending that she's going to go along with it, Laon attacks the Romulan, and as they tussle, the Romulan manages to put Laon's hand on the door pad and open it. But Laon ends up getting her gun and kills her, at which point she disappears herself before she dies. I guess so her body wouldn't be found. And the time device goes from red to green, indicating that the timeline was fixed. But before Laon uses the device to go back to her proper timeline, she goes into the room and finds Khan cowering in fear. He's a little kid. She has a brief conversation with him, and when he asks if she's there to take him away, she says, no, you're right where you need to be. And then she pushes the button to go back to her time, seemingly after leaving the gun in Khan's room. But um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I saw that or not. I'd have to go back and check. Anyway, she visits the bridge of the ship to verify that Captain Pike is there. And she finds him and number one embroiled in the situation with Pelia over the artifacts that she seems to have acquired, at which point Laon advises the captain that as a representative of Starfleet security, she thinks he should just let it go. She then goes to her quarters where she encounters a temporal agent who asks for the device back and tells her that she can't discuss what happened to her with anyone, which she finds upsetting given how traumatic it was. She takes off the watch that she still has and then places a random call to Lieutenant James Kirk and pretends that she's just looking for brief background details for Sam's file, namely his place of birth, which Kirk says was Iowa, same as him, Iowa on Earth. During the conversation, she's visibly upset, but keeps it together until the call ends, at which point she breaks down and sobs. And that's where the episode ended. So I really enjoyed this episode. I even enjoyed the portrayal of Kirk. I'm seeing glimmers of the old Kirk that we know in this portrayal of a younger Kirk. It's, it's starting to work for me. So we'll have to see how it goes in the future because we're, we're obviously not done 
with this version of Kurt on this show. I thought that Christina Chong did a fantastic job carrying this episode. You know, I've always liked her portrayal of La'an, but she really brought it home in this episode. The, the whole thing basically centered on her. You know, Kirk's there, but the whole thing really centered on her, and especially by the end. And she just did a great job carrying it. You know, this is an ensemble cast show, and her role thus far has never been pivotal to an episode, has never been the whole episode, but this time it was. And that can be a daunting thing for an actor when you're, you know, not the lead and you're a secondary character. It's rare that you would carry a whole episode, that you would be the focal point of a whole episode just in the industry. And so I think she met the challenge fantastically. She, she really was compelling throughout the whole thing. And of course, you know, this is something they did do on DS9 and Next Gen and so forth. But in terms of the setup of the story, the time paradox thing, I didn't think that that was anything special. It was very boilerplate. And that's fine because it didn't need to be anything special. The point of the episode was about how the events affected La'an, not the intricacies of the particular time travel story or the impact of any one particular change right it was just the ambiguous everything's going to be wrong if we don't fix this which is fine because it didn't distract from the actual story which was about la'an and specifically that story was here's a character that's very very guarded usually that's very you know stalwart and stoic because for one thing, their insecurity, which is a no-nonsense field, right? You have to be serious and stern and strong and project confidence at all times. And she's also got this, like she said, scarlet letter, this baggage that she carries around, which is her name, Noonien Singh, which has made it hard for her, as she points out in the episode, to connect with people. I mean, she has friends, but the implication in what she says is that she has a very small circle of friends and that people, as a thing are hard for her in life but because Kirk didn't know any of that about her about her past he was able to just deal with her in a straightforward way as just another human another person and she found that to be very pleasant and it allowed her to let herself go a little bit to the point where she allowed herself to catch feelings for him and I thought that was just a great bit of storytelling, a great bit of character development. You know, it's what you want to see in a good show. You want to see the characters go through things that speak to you as an audience member on a human level that you can relate with as someone who goes through things, <laughs> who feels things. And this story did that in spades. By the end, she's clearly changed by the experience. And they put that little knife twist on top of it where now she can't even talk to anyone about it by order of Starfleet, you know, the time police, which, you know, gets you right in the feels because you know that she needs to talk about it. She needs to work through the trauma of, you know, having had to kill somebody, having had to not kill somebody else having lost someone that she'd connected with and having gone through this literally galaxy altering thing that she now has to bear the emotional and psychological weight of alone and it was just really powerful in the end when she breaks down and sobs after she talks with lieutenant kirk so you know there was a lot to like about the episode in all of that. And I don't really have any critiques to level. I think there will be critiques leveled by other people. <laughs> other people are probably gonna say, well, it wasn't really Star Trek. It was just sort of a generic time travel story. There wasn't anything uniquely Star Trek about it. And as I was saying earlier, there wasn't anything uniquely Star Trek about it in the fact that there was no particular time travel plot 
that they were trying to undo. I mean, there was, but it was generic. It was an overall, hey, the galaxy is going to change type of thing. It wasn't focused on any particular thing, which, you know, makes it a little more generic and a little less Star Trek. So, yeah, you could argue that it wasn't very Star Trek, especially the bit about the car chase, which, you know, was more Fast and Furious or kind of heist movie than than anything Star Trek. Those similar things have happened in Star Trek. But, you know, whatever. It was fun. I don't think it detracted from the episode. You might have people complain that it was focused on a woman and it couldn't have been the man. It couldn't have been Pike that went through it and, you know, met up with a woman character that he fell in love with. Wait a minute. Where have I heard that? Be? I am the guardian of forever. Anyway, you might have people critique that, that it was kind of a ripoff of City on the Edge of Forever. And I don't know, I suppose you could argue that it was a bit of a ripoff of City on the Edge of Forever, but I think it had a different twist, right? Because she doesn't ha end up having to let the person that she fell for die. He just gets shot. Her choice is to not kill somebody else. And so it's it's a little bit of a variation. So I think it's fine. People might critique the fact that we don't have any idea how the time agent wound up on the Enterprise. Did he go there specifically to find La'an? Was it just random? Because it certainly is interesting that she ends up having a connection with the situation. But they don't say outright that he went there to find her specifically. And even if he did, how did he get there? We also don't know how the time agent got there at the end. The thing is, I don't know if we need to know. Because Star Trek has always done things that just happen. And if the story is good, you just kind of let it go and, and look at it and go, oh, so this random crazy thing happened and this is the story that came out of it. So I, that's fine. So like I said, I don't really have any critiques. I, I just, I think people are going to critique those things and I don't think they should. I was glad that they didn't retcon Kirk's backstory. I was concerned that they were going to based on the trailer for this episode or the previews for this episode where he goes, I'm from space. But they didn't end up retconning actual Kirk, which I was very glad for. This version is growing on me, so I'm interested to see where they're going to go with the character in the future. I don't think we've seen the last of Kirk on this show. And I'm guessing we're going to see Sam Kirk again, right? It's only been two episodes and there's no reason for them not to have him in this season. So we'll probably see him again. But that's really it. I'm going to get out of here. I'll be back to review the next episode once it's released. Until I return, I wish you peace and long life.